Now this is more like it. For the first time, the writers of the show managed to find that sweet spot of corporate intrigue and family melodrama that makes up the best of the show's episodes. The offices of Ewing Oil are being remodeled, so Bobby takes some sensitive red files home with him, disregarding JR's admonition that they should stay in the office. Bobby, those red files really ought to stay here in the office. Come on, JR, give me an alternative. Daddy needs his tally tonight, and I cannot work in that office. JR takes the opportunity to latch on his secretary, Julie, before sending her off to pick up his lunch. Predictable. That's me. As you well know. Unless, of course, you've forgotten. While she's out, Julie runs into Cliff Barnes, who asks her to dinner. Julie remains loyal to the Ewings, though, and turns him down. Meanwhile, Jock Ewing is playing cards with State Senator Wild Bill Orloff, one of the Ewings' legislature puppets. Jock and Orloff discuss Cliff's ethics investigation into Orloff, and Jock notes that Orloff doesn't have the muscle anymore to bottle up anti-Ewing legislation. Bill, used to be we could count on you to keep things bottled up forever. You used your muscle for us. Jock tells Bobby to give back the markers they have on Orloff because he's scared to death of Cliff, but Bobby thinks it will be difficult. Jock tells him to make sure that they keep it under wraps. Daddy, if he's scared, why call in his markers? Is that what you think of me, boy? What? I want to help the poor slob. Give him back the damn markers. While trying to figure out Orloff's finances, Bobby falls victim to Pamela's distraction with her perfect face. Unfortunately, he drops the very important files behind the couch and forgets about them. Miss Ellie, Sue Ellen, and Lucy arrive home, and Lucy takes the chance to twist the knife in Sue Ellen's back. Sue how come JR never comes home for lunch like Bobby does? JR's work is more demanded. When JR arrives home, Sue Ellen tries to seduce him with some lingerie, but JR rebuffs her and makes her feel like an idiot. JR, we don't make love anymore. It seems like this where JR really hits peak bastard. More on that in a minute. JR runs into Julie's arms to complain about Sue Ellen. Julie, to her credit, tries to stick up for Sue Ellen, but ultimately relents to her desire. JR turns Bastard up to 11 by refusing to stay with Julie until morning, and then gives her a $100 bill to, quote-unquote, buy herself something real nice. This mirrors a moment in Billy Wilder's fantastic film The Apartment, the only scene in movie history to actually make me yell at the screen. In the film, Fred McMurray has been having an ongoing affair with Shirley MacLaine. She gives him a heartfelt Christmas present from the restaurant where they had their first date, and he responds by leaving a 50 on the nightstand. I have never wanted someone so dead in all my life. JR only gets away with it because you just know that he's stepped in something. Big time. After JR leaves, Julia immediately calls Cliff and agrees to go on a date with him. Bobby realizes the next morning that he needs the red file and calls Pam to deliver them. Pam arrives and leaves Chekhov's file with Julie. Julie sleeps with Cliff and leaves the Orloff file under his pillow on the way out. Cliff is ecstatic about finding evidence of bribery from the Ewings. JR, somewhat understandably, accuses Pamela of handing the file off to her brother, giving us the title of the episode. There's a spy in the house. Bobby storms out when no one else speaks up for Pam and they hatch a plan to figure out how Cliff found the file. Julie also has regrets now that the document is public, but Cliff blows her off. Pam figures out that it's Julie, but Bobby can't believe it. Why are you so sure? Because she and JR had a have had a thing going on for years. What kind of thing? The public revelation puts the Ewings in an awkward position and drives a wedge between them and the senator. I don't have any choice. Orloff resigns and admits in propriety, but clears the Ewings of any wrongdoing on his way out. Why'd you shut that off? I wanted to hear that. Cliff is so angry that he tries to badger Julie into getting him more evidence. Julie storms out, feeling used once again. Listen, you remember, you remember the land oh, deal that JR put together oh, about two years man. ago? Oh. And uh, what about those oil leases that he bought for 50 cents on the dollar? Bobby tells JR that Julie was the one who gave the file to Barnes. When JR doesn't believe it, Bobby threatens him with revealing the affair. 
It turns out to be a moot point, though, because Julie admits guilt and storms out. I gave the file to Cliff Barnes. Oh, tell me why. Because you have to ask that. Afterwards, everyone makes up and all is forgiven. Spy in the House is the first episode to show what the series truly could be. It's got corporate intrigue, shady business dealings, and illicit sex all wrapped up into a tight 44 minutes. This is also the episode where we get a clear feel of the Ewing men and how they see the world, and it's done through contrasting scenes. Pam and Bobby are consistently affectionate, even when Bobby is calling for the Orloff file. I love you. I love you. JR is the polar opposite, with an emphasis on the polar. Thought I needed a little something to change my image. That's yeah. not you. Chuck gets some depth here as someone who is a ruthless businessman, but he's still fiercely protective of the people who are loyal to him. Hmm. I wonder if there's a real-life corollary there. JR has no such loyalties. Not to his wife, his brother, or to Julie herself. And that leads us to Julie, one of the series' more compelling characters in the first two seasons. Actress Tina Marie, best known for her role as Ginger on Gilligan's Island, was written off the show with the writers thinking that the series would end after five episodes. She would return in season two with an integral storyline, though. Like Christina Hendricks' Joan Harris in Mad Men, she prides herself on being able to manipulate powerful men with sex while wallflowers like Pam get trampled on, and fading beauties like Sue Ellen can't handle the lack of affirmation. It's easy to see Julie as a scorned harpy, jealously trying to destroy the man she can't have, but when you see the powerful man as an object instead of the subjective manipulator, you grant Julie a lot of respect. I love the scene where she storms out on Cliff, letting him know that he's no better than JR. But you made yourself sound so noble. I'm the good guys, they are the bad guys, that's the difference. Cliff Barnes likes to cast himself as a righteous crusader, taking on corruption in Austin. And he may believe that, but his crusade started as a personal vendetta, revenge on behalf of his humiliated father. To Cliff, using women, abusing relationships, and trampling over civil liberties is completely justified because he is the quote-unquote good guy. But then, the Ewings are pretty corrupt. At least the ones involved in the oil business. If only there were somebody who could lay vengeance on them.